The book of Deuteronomy, part 2. In our last lecture, Moses was giving a recount of the events that had befallen Israel concerning the children that had died off and those who would go into the promised land and even saying that himself, Moses, would not be allowed to enter into the promised land because he had earned the wrath of the Lord by striking the rock twice in the desert of sin, um, Kadesh Barnea, and the Lord, uh, Moses beseeched the Lord that he would allow him to go into the land and just see it, but the Lord had told him, no, you're not going in to see it, and I don't want to hear any more on this matter, I'm paraphrasing of course, but um, Moses has accepted his fate, he has been told that he will go up on the mountain and that he shall die. And at the end of this book, he shall pass away. And this will be the end of the five books of Moses, known as the Pentateuch. Also known as the Torah. In other words, the law. But we're going to pick it up now, with Moses continuing to speak to Israel. Concerning what they should do, and what they should not do. He's been making this clear throughout this book, and actually over the last couple of books. But he is repeating it, and repeating it, and repeating it. And it's done repetitively, so that they would know and understand that this is not a joke. That he is serious, that God is serious. And so, there is a lot of repetitiveness in this, but it is for the betterment of God's children, so that they may understand how serious a matter this is. So we will begin in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 1, and before we do... Let us go before our Father's throne and ask his guidance as we study this, his word. Glorious Heavenly Father and King of all that is, Creator of all that is in heaven and in earth and all the universe, we come before you, Father, and we ask you to fill our minds with the truth, Father. We ask you to reveal to us hidden secrets from your word through type, through analogy, and through literal. We ask you to help us understand, Father, as we diligently study your word, because we do care, Father, and we do take the time to read these words, because it was commanded of Moses by you that these words be read generation to generation to generation, father to son, to the children, and to the children's children, and to the children's children's children. So, we do this now, not only to learn, but to honor your commandment, Father. And we ask that, in searching out these words, that you reveal to us the deeper secrets hidden therein, and that you bless the eyes and ears of those who study with us, that they may obtain truth, and fill their baskets full of the bread, which is the bread of life, that they may be fully fed and their souls be not starved. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the true and only Messiah. Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 1. And Moses called Israel, all Israel, and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak unto your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them, or and keep and do them. Verse 2. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Horeb is, of course, the mountain in the wilderness. You can call it Sinai. It's where God appeared to the people. Verse 3. The Lord hath not made this covenant with our fathers, but us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. In other words, he made a covenant that he would give the, to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the children of Israel, but then he handed down the laws of the covenant, which is the agreement, the, uh, the uh, contract, in other words, by which God would bless Israel. Verse 4, And the Lord talked with you face to face at the mount of the midst of fire. 
Verse 5. I stood between you and the Lord at that time to show you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid by reason of the fire and went up not into the mount, saying, verse 6, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Verse 7, Thou shalt have none other gods before me. And again, you'll notice the lowercase on the word gods there. Anytime you see gods, or even king with lowercase, it is not referring to God the King, Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lords of Lords, or God other than false gods, because it is lowercase. In the sentence above, you see God written, I am the Lord thy God, in capital, uppercase. So this is one way, one little clue that we have to let us know who is being referred to and to rightly divide the subject and the object. Verse 8. Thou shalt not make to thee any graven image of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath. Verse 9. Thou shalt not bow thyself down unto them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. Again, uppercase on the word God here. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And again, there is a misunderstanding about this, that if the father sinned, then his son and his grandson and his great-grandson would have a curse upon them. Well, that's not what it means. It means if they continue in the same traditions of their fathers, even to the fourth generation, and I say even beyond, that God will visit their iniquities upon them. Because many people are taught things by their parents and they believe them because they respect their parents. I know there is a lot of children that don't respect their parents, but even so, the, the major things in life that we learn, we learn from our parents. So if your father is corrupt and teaches you the wrong things and you live by him and then your son lives by him and your grandson lives by him, well, God will get all four generations and not respect them and visit their iniquity upon them. Verse 10. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. In other words, God is merciful to those that respect him, love him, and revere him. Verse 11. Thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord thy God in vain. In other words, in vanity. For the Lord will not him, hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And this would refer to... Uh, many people think it is cussing or saying certain curse words, but what it is really referring to is you shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain and teach false things about God in vanity, which is emptiness. Because the Lord will not hold them guiltless, or guiltless that use his name to teach falsehoods. Verse 12. Although it is not good to curse or say certain curse words which involve the word God, if you catch my drift. Verse 12. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord God hath commanded thee. Verse, days, or verse 13. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Verse 14. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, may rest as well as thou. In other words, it is a day of rest. It is the Lord's Sabbath, but the day of rest was made for man, so that he could recoup. And it is a type and symbology of in the seventh day, at the seventh trump, God will give us rest because what is our rest? What is our Sabbath? It is Christ who was sacrificed on the Sabbath day and became the lamb slain for one and all times to bear our iniquity that we may have eternal life. Verse 15. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and through an outstretched arm therefore the Lord commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day 
verse 16. Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord God giveth thee. And that means any land the Lord God gives thee. Not just this land of Canaan. Anywhere where the children of Israel would sojourn throughout all of mankind's history, you are to keep these commandments. Verse 17. Thou shalt not kill. In other words, thou shalt do no murder. We have seen that it is necessary, and God has even ordered people to go out to war and to kill. And at times, in war, it is necessary for men to kill each other. To defend what they believe, or defend freedom, or to defeat oppressors. This word kill is the word um, murder, or it is it means the word murder. Verse 18. Neither shall thou commit adultery. In other words, you shall not uh, sleep with your neighbor's wife or with anyone that is betrothed. And this word is akin to idolatry. In other words, we're to wait on our true husband, the true Christ, and not to fall off to idolatry. In other words, to worship a lesser god or a fallen angel claiming to be God. And this has that connotation to it. Verse 19. Neither shalt thou steal, verse 20, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. You will not tell a lie on your neighbor for any reason to keep yourself out of trouble or to blame them for something they didn't do. Verse 21. Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou cover thy neighbor's house, his field, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Verse 22. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more, and he wrote them in two tables of stone, which are the tablets of the Ten Commandments, and delivered them unto me. Verse 23. And it came to pass, when ye heard the voice in the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. Verse 24. And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. Verse 25. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we, then we shall die. In other words, they were scared. They were terrified of the voice of God. It's most likely, as I said, as the sound of many thunders. And of course, man in his flesh is afraid of what he doesn't understand. And he has good reason to revere the Lord and respect the Lord after this manner. But anyway, verse 26. For is there all of flesh, or is there of all flesh, that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of fire as we have lived? In other words, is there any others who have heard the voice of the Lord God? Well, not as he uttered from the mountain. There would be certain people like uh, Balaam and others that the Lord had spoken to, or the angel of the Lord. But this was a thundering loud roar, and it got the attention of the children of Israel, albeit they would murmur against him again and again and again and again. Verse 27. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord God shall say. Speak thou unto us, that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, we will hear it and do it. In other words, they wanted Moses to go up there and hear the words of God and then come and tell them, because they were afraid of the voice of God. Verse 28. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and when he spake unto me, the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. In other words, they are right to be afraid and to revere and fear me. Verse 29. 
Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Verse 30. Go, say to them, Get ye into your tents again. Verse 31. But as for thee, in other words, talking to Moses, Stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto you all the commandments, and the statutes, and the judgments, which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. Verse 32. And ye shall observe to do therefore, as the Lord God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left hand. Left hand, or to the left. In other words, you're not going to turn out of the way. You're going to do exactly as the Lord has said. Verse 33. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God command to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. And again, this would be any land where Israel would sojourn, even when they are scattered. That thou mightest fear or revere the Lord thy God, and keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and they may, that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In other words, there is only one God. Now, Christ came, and he was God in the flesh, Emmanuel, and there is the Holy Spirit, but these are not three separate things. There are one God and three offices. And if this was understood between um, some of the peoples of the other religions, which sprang off of the Hebrew religion, uh, including Islam, then um, there would be no, no consternation like there is now. Because many of the Muslims believe that Christians divide God into a three. When the Lord God is one God, as you have just read here, by the words of Moses, from the mouth of the Lord God. Verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Remember what Christ said when he was asked, What is the first or the greatest commandment? He answered back this verse. Verse 6. And the words, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Verse 7. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt walk in them. And when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Verse 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. In other words, what is between your eyes or in your forehead? They shall be in front of your eyes always is what this means. But um, when it says between thine eyes, you're to keep them in your mind. Verse 9. And thou shalt write them on the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And remember what we had the analogy of, of the blood of Christ on the doorposts. And what the doorposts signify is being the doorposts which enter into your mind. In other words, having the blood of Christ in your mind to protect you from deception. Verse 10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into a land which he swore unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give thee the great land, or to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not. In other words, they were already built. Verse 11. And houses full of good things, which thou fillest not. In other words, it was the spoils of the people that they overtook. And the wells digged, which thou diggest not. 
vineyards, and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten, thou shalt be full. And you've got the connotation here of vineyards, which bring forth the grape, and olive trees, and both of these are symbolic, the blood of the vine, the grape, and the oil, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, and the blood of uh, the the wine, of course, symbolic of uh, the blood of Christ shed. Uh, as we move into the future, again, this is a prophetical and a template for things to come. Verse twelve. And beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. And many in this nation would do well to remember these words. Verse thirteen. Thou shalt fear the name of the Lord and serve him, and thou shalt swear by his name. Verse 14. Ye shall not go after other gods. Lowercase g on the word gods. Of the gods, lowercase g again, of the people which are round about you. In other words, ye shall not fall off to the other religions of the land. You have your religion. You have seen God on the mountain. You have heard his voice. You have seen his mighty hand deliver you from Egypt, and feed you in the desert, and give you water, and see that you lacked for nothing. In other words, do not go a whoring after other false gods. Not even Satan when he comes as the Antichrist. Verse 15. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord shall be kindred against thee, and shall destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Verse 16. And thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massah. And uh, actually they tempted him many times. But um, you're not to tempt the Lord. In other words, uh, this tempting the Lord would be, you, ca you can't tempt the Lord with temptation. In other words, you shall not tempt him to destroy you by murmuring against him and by disobeying his commandments and disregarding him as nothing. Verse 17. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. Verse 18. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in to possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers. Verse 19. To cast out all thine enemies from before thee, as the Lord has spoken. Verse 20. And when thy son asketh thee in times to come, saying, What meaneth the testimonies, and the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Verse 21. Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen, or slaves, in Egypt. And the Lord who brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, verse 22, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. Verse 23. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in and give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. Verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all his statutes for fear of the Lord, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is to this day. Verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all the commandments before the Lord God as he hath, command, as he hath commanded us. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And you've got a type here with the seven nations. I'll leave it at that for now. Verse 2. When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant or that is to say, agreement or contract with them, nor show mercy unto them. And this is where Joshua, in the next book, is going to screw up really bad. 
He is going to make a covenant with some people because they're going to fool him. And this is how the Kenites will enter into the tribes of Israel and be, start being called Jews. Verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou get, take unto thy son. In other words, you shall not marry with the other peoples. Israel shall stay within Israel. And some people upon reading this will say, well, God is just a racist. God is bigoted. No, he's not. He did this to preserve Israel and to keep their seed pure. Verse 4. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, again, lowercase, they will anger, the, and the, so the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. In other words, this is the purpose. Verse 4. Not to mention there is the word mamzer. If you look it up, as I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, which has to do with keeping the racial lines pure. God created the races the way he liked them. He created the white man in his glory. He created the black man in his glory. He created the red man in his glory. He created the Asian or yellow man in his glory. And he created all the races in their own majesty. And he wanted them to stay that way. And people have forgotten that this since time immemorial and now have begun to crossbreed the races. And there's nothing racial in this statement that I'm saying, and it's not my own idea. It's written in these pages that you're reading. Verse 5. But if ye shall deal with them, and shall destroy their altars, and shall break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire, verse 6, Thou art an holy people unto the Lord God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee, to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, does this mean that they're better than anyone else? No. It means he chose them especially to do these works. In other words, to carry forth his covenant, and when Christ would come, to carry forth the word unto the world, as it is written, the gospel must first be published amongst all nations. And the word nations is ethnos in the Greek, which means the peoples of the world. God loves all of his children, no matter what color or background they are. He created them all. He made every one of them a living soul. And God is no respecter of persons. However, he did choose Israel to this destiny. Verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest of all people. And think about the election written of. How few they are as to the majority of the world which shall go a whoring after the harlot of Babylon and the Antichrist. Verse 8. <clears throat> but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep an, uh, the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you of the house of bondmen from the hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God which keepeth the covenant and mercy with them that love him, and that keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Do you understand how far that is? That's to this generation, beloved. Verse 10. And he repayeth them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to them that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. And many of them will get repaid when they stand face to face with him, when they pass out of this flesh age, after having spent their lives trying to disprove him. But 
even in that there is a cloak of innocency and we do have the millennium in which will God will see to it that every soul shall learn the truth. In other words, no one shall be destroyed or go to hell in ignorance of the truth and not knowing that the Lord God is one God and that he does exist. Verse 11. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to those judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. Verse 13. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land and thy corn and thy wine and thine oil and increase thy kind which is cattle and thy flocks of thy sheep in the land he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Verse 14. And thou shalt be blessed above all people. Now this did not say that you would be loved more than any other people. It says you're going to be blessed among all people. Why? Well, because through this line of people would come Christ, and through Christ would the door be opened to all mankind to enter in and have salvation. That is to say, even the heathen, even the ethnos, even those who never knew God, even those who still live as savages or as tribes who have never heard the word, for God is fair. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. Verse 15. And the Lord will taketh away from thee all sickness and will put none evil diseases or none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee but will lay them upon all that hate thee. Verse 16. And thou and thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee Thine eye shall have no pity upon them, neither shall thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. In other words, it will be a trap unto you if you go a whoring after their gods. And if you do not consume all the people that the Lord has directed for you to consume. And again, one of the reasons for this would be that they had inbreeded with the giants or that they were worshipping false gods and doing abominable things which the Lord himself has killed people for. Verse 17. If thou shalt say in thy heart, the nations are more than I, how can I dispose them? Verse 18. Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but thou shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Verse 19. The great temptations which thine eyes saw, and the signs and wonders, and the mighty hand, and the outstretched arm, whereby the Lord God brought thee out, so so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people whom thou art afraid. In other words, of all the people who are greater greater and mightier than you, even if they have a bigger army, even if they have nuclear warheads that you don't have, even if they have things that you don't have, God will protect you and deliver them into your hand. Verse 20. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send a hornet among them until they that are left hide themselves from thee, be destroyed. In other words, this is a, this is a, a Hebraism, an analogy. He's going to send a hornet among them. Well, have you ever had a nest of hornets get after you? Verse 21. Thou shalt not be affrighted at them. For the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. And this word terrible means terrible in power. Verse 22. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee, little by little, that thou mayest consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. Verse 23. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction, until they be destroyed. Verse 24. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under the heaven, or under heaven, and there shall be no man able to stand before thee, until thou have destroyed them. Verse 23. And 
uh, the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. In other words, even after you burn these idols of silver and gold, you will not take the silver and gold thereof. Verse 26. Neither shall thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. In other words, you will not bring any of their gods into your house because they are made of silver and gold and they're pretty and they're worth a lot of money. But thou shalt utterly detest it. Thou shalt utterly abhor it. For it is a cursed thing. And we will see this later on when we talk about Achan. Verse 8. All the commandments which I commanded thee this day shall thou observe and do, that ye may live and multiply, and go and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. Verse 2. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, in other words, to test thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou would keep his commandments or no. Verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. In other words, you didn't know what it was. That's what the word manna means. What is it? Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread daily, but e but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And Christ would also quote this, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth from the mouth of the Lord. Verse 4. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth not his son, in other words, corrects or disciplines not his son, so the Lord God chasten thee. Or, excuse me, I shouldn't have put the word not in there. As a man chasteneth his son, which is to say disciplineth his son, so did the Lord God chasten thee. Verse 6, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to fear him. Verse 7, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, and fountains of depths, that spring out of valleys and hills. Verse 8, A land of wheat and barley, and vines, and fig trees, and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Verse 9. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. In other words, there will be plenty. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Now I want you to consider that as you think about the great rich deposits of metals found in this United States. In other words, this prophecy goes even to this great nation and even to the nations of Europe where they found tin and copper and precious metals. Verse 10. When thou hast eaten and are full, thou shalt bless the Lord thy God in the land which the Lord hath given thee. Verse 11. Beware that thou not forget the Lord thy God in keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command you this day. Verse 12. Lest thou, when thou hast eaten and thou art full and built goodly houses and dwelt therein. Verse 13. And when thy herds and thy folks multiply and thy silver and thy gold are multiplied and all thou hast is multiplied. Verse 14. Then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. In other words, when times become good, people tend to forget the Lord. And their heart is lifted up. And whose heart was lifted up in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28? Satan. Lifted up in pride so that he thought himself to be as good as God and wanted to sit on God's mercy seat. Verse 15. Who led thee 
through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were the fiery serpents and the scorpions, drought, and there was no water, who brought thee forth water of the rock of flint. Verse 16. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and he might prove or test thee, to do good to thee at thy latter end. Again, we're concerning the latter end of man here. Verse 17. And thou shalt say in thy heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. In other words, this would be if your heart was raised up in pride. In other words, I did this. Remember what happens to Nebuchadnezzar when he walks into Babylon and says, Have I not done all this and created this great Babylon by my power and my mighty hand? And look what happened to him. Look what God did to him. God got his attention right real quick. And he wrote the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel as a memorial to God, as a beautiful prayer. Verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Verse 19. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, notice the lowercase g, and serve them, and worship them, I will testify against you in the day and ye shall, that ye shall surely perish. Verse 20. As the nations which the Lord God destroyeth before your face, so ye shall perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 1. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over this Jordan this day, Go in to possess the nations, greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. In other words, with tall walls, verse 2. A, a, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, who thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak. And of course, the Anakims here are the giants, verse 3. Understand, therefore, this day, the Lord thy God is he that goeth before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them and bring them down before thy face, so thou shalt drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. Verse 4. Speak not thou in thine heart after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me to possess this land. But for wickedness of the nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Do you see what I mean about it's not because Israel was so righteous? Because they were a stiff-necked and stubborn people. But these people of the land were wickeder than they. They worshipped false gods. And some of them were perversions of natures because they were gibor, which means giants, hybrids, the offspring and progeny of fallen angels. Verse 5. Not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightnesses of thy heart, dost thou go to possess the land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 16, or verse 6. Understand therefore that the Lord God, God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. For thou art a stiff-necked people. In other words, you're a stupid and slow to learn people, is how this could be translated. Verse 7. Remember and forget not how thou provoked the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness in the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt. Until ye came unto this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Verse 8. Also at Horeb you provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. Verse 9. When I was gone up on the mount to receive the tables of stone, in other words, the tablets with the Ten Commandments on it, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, and I abode in the mountain forty days and forty nights, neither did I eat bread nor drink water. Verse 10. 
the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words which thou spake with you in the mount out of the midst of fire in the day of the assembly. In other words, the day that God spoke out of the midst of fire before all the children of Israel. Verse 11. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights, the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the two tables of the covenant, which are the tablets with the Ten Commandments. Verse 12. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get ye down quickly for hence, for thy people that thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And notice he said, thy people, not my people. They weren't his people anymore because they turned on him. They are quickly turned aside out of the way I commanded them and have made them a molten image. Verse 13. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Verse 14. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of thee a great and mightier nation than they, or a mightier and greater than they. Verse 15. So I turned and came down from the mount. Now Moses didn't mention here that he spake to the Lord and turned his anger away from the children, but anyway, verse 15. So I turned and came down the mountain, the mount that burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. Verse 16. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf, and had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord God commanded you. Verse 17. And I took the two tables, and cast them out of my two hands, and break them before your eyes. Verse 18. And I fell down before the Lord, as at the first, Forty days and forty nights, neither did I eat bread nor drink water, because of all your sins which ye sinned, in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Verse 19. For I was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened to me at that time also. Verse 20. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. Verse 21. And I took your sin, the calf which ye had made, and burnt it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it, into ve it, ground it very small, even as it was small as dust, and cast the dust thereof into the brook that descendeth out of the mountain, or out of the mount, and at Taborah, and at Massah, and at Kibro Hatava, ye provoke the Lord God to wrath. Now we know that uh, in verse 21 there, it says he cast it, the dust into the brook, but he also made the people drink of the water. Verse 23. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up to possess the land which I have given you, then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and believed him not, nor hearkened unto his voice. Verse 24. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Verse 25. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights. I fell down at the first, because of the Lord had said he would destroy you. Verse 26. And I prayed therefore unto the Lord, and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. Verse 27. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor their wickedness, nor their sin. Verse 28. Lest the land, excuse me, lest the land whence thou brought us out, say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Verse 29. Yet they are thy people, thine inheritance, which thou broughtest up by mighty power and by a stretched out arm. Okay. 
I think we're going to stop here and not try to get through chapter 10 because we're already getting up there in time. But um, again, we're, we're having a recap of all that has happened to Israel. And it is being done repetitively. And the reason it's done repetitively is so that when you read it in all these books and you read it over and over and over again, you will learn it. There is no man that sits down to learn to play the piano or the guitar or that uh, learns any skill uh, unless he do it repetitively. In other words, practice makes perfect, so to speak. And the Lord God put these words in the mouth of Moses. And Moses is writing all these things repetitively so that they first of all, will not be lost to the generations. I'm sure he thought that uh, maybe some of these books might disappear. And indeed, when King James translated the Bible, he, uh, for his own reasons, or for the reasons of the people that he used to translate the Bible, did take certain books out of the Bible, such as Second Esdras and uh, various other books, which can be found now in the Apocrypha, or the Apocryphal books. The Good Speed Apocrypha is a highly recommended book if you want to study these books. But anyway, this is being said over and over and over. And the reason it's being said over and over and over is because this is a stiff-necked people. And they always have been since the day they entered into Egypt and started to multiply to the day that they were brought out, to the day that they became a people Israel, to the day that they split into two tribes, the northern and southern kingdoms of Judah and Samaria, to the captivities that they endured of Assyria and Babylonia, and even Rome occupying them, and until they're being scattered amongst all nations because of their whoredoms and idolatry and turning away out of the way of God, so that they were dispersed from the land which the Lord had given them, the land of Canaan. And they were sent north and west towards the setting of the sun. And they migrated and came into Europe, crossing those Caucasian mountains and becoming Caucasians, and then being called uh, by various names, the Chimerians, which is a derivative of the word Sumerians, and Gumerians, and Iberians, Ibrians, in other words, and Hiberians, and they settled Europe, and from Europe they went forth and went to America, and to Australia and New Zealand, and compassed all basically the Christian nations of the world. However, in these times that we lived, all of these nations have started to forget God with the help of the Kenites and with the help of the uh, Sadducee. Edomite mentality of socialism which takes away God from amongst us and offers little free gifts and trinkets but never really delivers anything worthwhile. In other words, it keeps people poor by giving them just enough to survive. Here, we'll feed you, we'll give you welfare, we'll give you Medicaid, we'll give you a HUD home, We'll give you all these things so that it will break your spirit to strive. And while you're so busy doing this, we're going to give you things like this wonderful television to watch and this wonderful internet to be on. And it's going to keep you so occupied. And all these movies that you can go see and these hot rod cars and beer and liquor and, and football games and NASCAR and all these wonderful things which take you away from your Father's Word so that you don't read it and so that God is removed from your memory. And as the generations have progressed, or have progressed, I should say digressed backwards, or uh, regressed, each successive generation has gotten farther and farther away from the Lord. And you can see it just by looking at how things were from the 1940s till now, it, the difference in how people looked, 
in the difference in how people act. Not that there have not always been those corrupt and gangsters and and um, mobsters and, and what have you. There have always been evil. But now people have become so self-consumed and so self-important till even when the truth is explained to them in great detail, all they want to do is argue about it and say, no, man evolved from apes. There is no God, that's a myth. Or if they do have some faith, they want to be likened to the seven churches. Only two of them please God. The rest of them uh, were okay, but they weren't really pleasing to God because he had somewhat against them. Christ had somewhat against them. As written in the book of Amos chapter 8, which we will be getting to eventually, the famine for the end times is not for bread. In other words, it's not for food for your belly, your flesh belly. It is for spiritual food. It is for hearing and understanding the word of God. So as always, brothers and sisters in Christ, it is my prayer for you that you will partake of that bread of life and not be hungered, and that you will partake of that living water and not be athirst. And may God bless you as you study in his word diligently and seek his counsel and be one of those few who care enough to dig into your father's word to find out the real truth and to go into the old languages and to understand the manners of speech and to rightly divide the Bible as by subject and object so that you aren't confused and put other things ahead of the truth, other things with due to fleshly concerns. May God bless your path and hold you close to him in his bosom. May he lead you and guide you and shine the light for you to walk in. May he watch after you and preserve you that your days be prolonged even unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ that you may do service and honor him by not bowing any to the false Christ. God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.